The Money Show. Personal Finance with Warren Ingram. Co-founder of Galileo Capital, Warren Ingram, regular contributor to The Money Show, personal financial advisor, chartered financial planner, and many other accolades to boot. He wants to talk about building generational wealth. Before we get to generational wealth, I need to know what you're smoking here, Warren, because generational wealth implies that there's enough left over at the end of your life to give the next generation a leg up. And I don't know if there's too much intergenerational wealth being created. Never mind, well, not enough for one lifetime, never mind kick-starting the next one. How realistic is this? Um, there, there, there are quite a few families, you know, in South Africa that, that are in this position. And I'm not talking about the ones that we see in the headlines of of the media all the time. Uh, I'm talking about f- families that, you know, get get near the end of, uh, of, of the founders' lives, let's say mom and dad. And uh, and and they know they've got enough uh, money to live on, and and certainly have some money to to give to the next generation, and uh, and and I think it's you know um, I think it's easy to kind of get uh, uh, not distracted, I think, but despondent that no 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 wealth is being created. But but let me tell you, uh, I think there must be uh, quite a few businesses generating uh, um, you know that, that kind of money right now you know especially in the world in the world of solar right now as an example uh, and and many other businesses you know I think it's it's one of those things uh, we tend to focus on 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 the bad times and the like Bruce but but there are families out there and you know b- building businesses you know, um, you know, either either things that they've started or, or working for other people that are that are doing this consistently, day after day, year after year. And I'm not talking about the Mark Zuckerbergs and the the Ruperts and the Motsepis. I'm talking about you know, kind of pretty ordinary South African doing this uh, very consistently, you know, day after day and year after year and decade after decade. Okay, well, tell me how to do it then, because I, I think it's kind of important. It does, is it is the prerequisite that you need a big idea, you need to start an empire, grow an empire, capitalize on the growth of that empire, or can we build, realistically speaking, intergenerational wealth by letting other people do the work and us just investing in it? Um, I think that's exactly right. So, so I'm not, you know, those the the big names that we've all we've all seen that that, that have you know the, the fabulous private jets and and you know fund their 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 ventures into space and the like. The, those are you know really bright, really hardworking, and supremely lucky people. And we can't underestimate the role of all three factors in in them generating that wealth. I'm not talking about luck. You know, I think uh, you know when you focus on luck as an investment strategy, you, you're <laughs> you're bound to be disappointed more often than not. So so we're not talking about that. We're we're talking about you know let, let's just say someone who you know starts out uh, you know just working, just get, getting a job, starts saving, and and uh, you know uh, th- th- that's it's possible for them to do. It could be someone that starts a small business. Uh, it, it, it's not really the the the, the success of, of the the business venture that they've got or the career they've got. It's the habits that they that they develop for themselves, and then how they impart those habits on their children. And maybe step one and two are, are worth kind of talking about together. So the one is uh, you have to start saving and then investing as early and as fast as possible. And I know that sounds obvious, but but it takes a heck of a long time for most people to to kind of build that first million, and and so you know to build that first million uh, that, that um, for most of South Africa's population, you know, if you retire with a million, unfortunately, you're not in the intergenerational wealth, but but it is possible for people to build up that money and then to to take one to two and i think you know when you start getting into that space of 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 investment assets where you're taking one million and making it two then you're getting into the point of of uh, building some kind of wealth that maybe becomes um intergenerational and and uh, you know there's this age-old rule uh, that that uh, i don't think we've spoken about but but i'm sure lots of people do called the rule of 72 Uh, and 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 the premise of the rule of 72 is you say um how fast do I expect my investments to grow? And uh, and and let, I'm using ten percent, and and I'll explain why now. But okay. but I think ten percent is a good a, a good projection. And then you say, well, take uh, seventy two, and you divide it by the the growth rate of your investment. So so if we're saying seventy two divided by ten, fortunately even I can do that math. So that's <laughs> seven point two. Right. Uh, 
So, so, so the reason uh, we we look at that is it's it's telling us that it will take seven point two years for for your money to double if you expect it to grow at ten percent a year, okay. and and clearly you, you know you if you if you want to get some money to start growing and start doubling you need to get get, get that started as fast as possible. Why we talk about ten percent is if you look at uh, uh, you know the average growth rate of of kind of a typical balanced portfolio, a balanced unit trust, or most uh, kind of um, exchange traded funds that track shares, or most general equity funds, a, a growth rate of about ten percent a year over a, uh, over a decade or two is a very fair, very realistic assumption. Despite all the negativity and all the stuff that's happened, the money. Uh, uh, sorry, we we had a little bit of an interjection there, Warren. But yes, absolutely, that that notion that it can happen, and that's all well and good. But when we and and we need to understand what the framework is of intergenerational wealth. My idea of intergenerational wealth is what the Oppenheimers and the Ruperts pass on to each other. You're suggesting that we can create enough money, we can we can certainly um, save enough money in our lifetimes to look after ourselves during our lifetimes, uh, hopefully give the next generation a bit of a leg up during our lifetimes. But on the day that we depart this mortal coil, there is something left in the kitty to help them on their way so they get a bit more of a head start than perhaps we did. Exactly right, and 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 then you start to build a, a legacy, uh, a, a family legacy, because you're you're giving the next generation a head start that perhaps you didn't have, uh, and and I think you're giving them two uh, two head starts there, Bruce. It's not just one. So it's not just you know uh, so, some capital that they can use to, for, for example, to you know put down a massive deposit on a house or potentially buy a house. You're, you're also giving them a legacy of. Specific behaviors that, that that you've developed and and habits that you've developed and and conversations that you've had w- with w- with your children that give them a head start um, financially, both from a numbers point of view, but also a financial literacy and a, and financial habits point of view. And I think that that's maybe the, the the part that's kind of a softer skill that we just don't talk about enough uh, in when it comes to to money. So so I think. You know, definitely the one part is save early. Second part is keep saving uh, every single month. You know, every single year, accelerate the saving uh, because that's how you, you know, you make the rule of seventy-two. Be, be, you know, uh, w- work in your favor. You, you start to say, well, if you save every month as well, th- then suddenly it doesn't take you seven years to to kind of you know double your money. It takes you three or four years to to double your money, and, and, and then you know, yeah, ma- and making one into two into four. Is, yeah. is a eight or nine year exercise. It's not a eighteen year exercise. And the best example of this, and is our discussions with Julia. And we've been doing the Julia discussion annually for most of the last decade, at least. And Julia um, starts out uh, with your advice, of course, um, taking a lump sum of 70,000 rand, and this is going to be fuzzy memory stuff, but 70,000 rand, putting it into investments and trickling it into investments just before the global financial crisis. She then takes a third of everything she earns, and at that stage, it's 300,000 rand a year. So she's investing 100,000 rand a year regularly into the stock market. And as her income grows, she invests a third of that income. She is human. Um, if she cut her, she bleeds apparently. Um, and you know, during tough times, she she panics a little bit, but she comes back to investing. And and over time, you see this astonishing accumulation of wealth up until a point where about five years ago, she stops adding to South African investments because she has kids and buys a house and gets the Volvo and uh, and uh, opens her own business and starts doing more offshore investing. But that South African sort of cash pile is growing at an astonishing rate every year with her doing nothing. And the money money makes money. And it, it is the most beautiful thing to watch. And I think, you, you know, um, I mean, we, 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 had, we had lots of feedback from, from listeners over the years about Julia, you know, especially in the beginning, people thought we'd, we'd kind of manufactured a, you know, and, and got, got an actor in or something to talk about, you know, to pretend to be somebody. And, you know, she's over a time, very think, good actor. Kind of if, if, if she is yeah. an actor, she's very good at it. Um, no, but yeah. she's real. She is real. But but what, what one thing that, uh, that, that she wouldn't mind us saying is she's by no means some sort of, you know, uh, entrepreneurial superstar where she, you know, she built something that, that, you know, that, that was 
life changing. She she worked in businesses, you know, and she she built she she built a career in you know working for other you know for for other people and was incredibly diligent about the way she saved, uh, and and that was the, the the superpower was staying disciplined and saving, and when when she got increases, saved faster and and saved more. Uh, while going on holiday, while having children, all of those things, you know. So, so she lived in some some respects. Uh, I mean, that's, I'm saying it as if she's she's not dead. She's not. I mean, she but she lives a fairly normal life in in many respects. But she's extraordinary in the way she starts saving and then keeps saving so consistently without excuses and and without that sort of negativity. And then you and I watch the results, which are as you say, astonishing, but but actually not different. She didn't, you know, become a superstar investor where she was doing things totally different to everybody else. She was buying index investments and, and you know, stuff that's available to all of us, uh, even if we only have 50 bucks. Dare I, dare I say she was doing really boring things, but really boring things deliver superlative outcomes. And she, yeah, no fancy stuff, no hocus pocus, no share trading accounts where she was trading in and out of positions three times a day, um, waking up at two o'clock in the morning to see what was happening on Asian markets and then last thing before bed at 11 o'clock at night, seeing what happened in the US and panicking each and every single day about minutiae of market movements. Just letting the market do the work. Letting the market doing the work, making the commitment. And it is somebody one day, and, and maybe she'll do it herself, but just to to tell the Julia story as an individual story. I know many people have criticized over the, the years, that, oh, but she earned so much. Well, yes, because she was very good at what she did. We're talking about the possibility here. And most people say, well, you can't build wealth from a job. And I think Julia is the exception that says, hold on a second, uh, you're talking nonsense. It is about sometimes some sacrifice and not living and, and not buying stupid cars and stupid houses and living and, and, and city outfits and all of that sort of stuff, but being sensible about balancing a life between enjoyment and commitment to long-term savings. And, and I think being very clear and, and very deliberate in the, in the way that you spend and not just doing things out of habit. So, so for example, I mean, you know, she absolutely loves travel, and and so that was, you know, in in her life, the, the thing that she would ex- spend much more money uh, r- relative to to the rest of, of of how she spent. So so for her, a car was just a means of transport, and it needed to be safe and secure. Be- beyond that, you, you know, she she was happy to drive a very low cost, very cheap car for a very long period of time, uh, until until the you know the, the kids came along, and then she bought a fractionally more expensive. Uh, no, 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 but you mean, you're but missing. Lots, uh, a crucial step here, Warren, because my memory is not fantastic, but on this fact, it is absolutely clear. And it also comes down to the choice of life partner that you introduce into your life. We are allowed to be introduced into your life. They've got to be somebody who's fairly like-minded in the way in which they value money, the values they hold around money, their sense of expectation when it comes to money. And she chooses a life partner who comes along and when she says, I need to get a new car, you take the old one, which by then I'm assuming is a fairly dated version of an Opal Corsa light. And the man of sufficient masculinity to fold himself double into that little car and to drive it until the wheels fall off is quite remarkable. That is also a critical lesson in terms of ego pride and not allowing that nonsense to get in the way of, of a strategy. Absolutely, I had the ple- and I'm saying I'm saying the words uh, um, carefully here. But I had the real pleasure of speaking to one of our one of our fans of our show and and today and and he 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 is very proud of the fact that he drives a, a 17 year old car and and then alternates that with his son's 11 year old car and and he you know he has in any respect you know triple generation wealth and and he's deeply proud of the fact that uh, that you know he'll drive uh, you know in, in a car that a lot of people with much less money and incredibly incredible amounts of debt would be embarrassed to drive and his only criteria is the car needs to be safe and there's yeah. much more that he can do with his money both for himself his family and for the the charities that he funds and and those are ingrained principles that he's got that he's passing on to his his children and i think maybe that's the key and this is building intergenerational wealth is not just a money thing it's also giving your your children a, a financial education it's imparting the habits that you've built up over time uh, and and not just hiding money conversations from your children it's about explaining to them 
how you do things, what's your approach, and maybe what is our as the family, what are what are the ways we think about money and and what do we think about conspicuous consumption and what do we think about you know living to to kind of other people's idea of what what life should be, you know, and is it important that other people think we're rich or is it important that that, that we become custodians of, of money and and we use it wisely and we respect it. And and you know, do we allocate some money to help others? And and then are we thinking about ourselves uh, as protectors for future generations? Because those are fabulous habits to impart on 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 children, and to do it from a very young age, and to have lots of serious conversations with children on an ongoing, continuous basis, I think is is absolutely key in in building intergenerational wealth. And, and you know, and something when you talk to parents about this, that, that you know, they kind of shy away from this a lot of the time to say, no, 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 I could never tell my kids, you know, they'll never work or that they'll never, you know, kind of have ambition. And I I think that's a cop out. You know, that that just means the job's not done. You've got you've got to be teaching your children all the time and talking to them all the time. And don't rely on on schools to do this and don't don't rely on you know, kind of a 30 second conversation or, you know, kind of a game, you know, gamifying money. You, you, this is something you've got to impart, like you impart, you know, healthy habits and, and, and all the other things. This is one you've got to give to your children. Don't just focus on the money side. It's the education side as well. And tragically, most families, I suspect, as lifespans increase thanks to better medical care and we take better care of ourselves hopefully during our lifetimes that perhaps previous generations did we're better nourished we have far more advantages Uh, as life expectancies extend and we are able to live longer lives there's the likelihood of being able to leave something behind diminishes um simply because you know in the last couple of years of life medical expenses can go awry and all sorts of things i mean there, there's lots of stuff that can happen but if you have imparted valuable life lessons on your children in terms of money respecting money where it comes from and what it can do without you interfering in it um you will be leaving them better off than most kids frankly in the world I'm 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 going to uh, challenge you a little bit because I I feel of if course. we're going to be living healthier lives for longer, th- then that means we actually have the ability to earn more money for longer periods of time. And fair enough. And you know, you fair know, enough. Fair and, enough. And so the, the opportunity to create uh, triple generation wealth in your first generation as, you know, a very ordinary career person, I, I mean, I, I think the, the, the opportunities are there, you know, and, and, and we just look at how much wealth was created by Warren Buffett, you know, in, in his 50s and 60s or, or Yanni Maton, you know, in his 50s and 60s, I think. You know, just kind of planning for planning for the average or planning for a degrading life, I think, is is a real mistake. Now, we we could be really healthy and and maybe you know, sixties the new forty and and so on and I so sta- on. All those cliches stand, are real. I stand chastised and corrected. I've got an email. <laughs> um, it says, "Good day, Warren. I'm a retired individual. Congratulations. I have some money, about two hundred and fifty thousand rand, that I would like to give." my two sons i think it would benefit them to get the money now rather than wait for my death one day i want to assist them to pay off some debt and invest the rest what would this be the right thing to do what is the best way to pass the money over to them i i i, I couldn't agree more i think it's a it's a fantastic idea and 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 certainly if your if your two sons are are you know proving to be reasonably responsible with money, uh, and you know that they that uh, they are going to use it to settle debt, you know, and it's debt that was incurred, you know, in a, in a good way. In other words, maybe it's home loans, and they just you know they just need a leg up in in difficult times. They, then I think it's a fantastic idea, uh, and and just to remember that SARS allows us to donate up to a hundred thousand rand per per year to our uh, to anybody you want including our adult uh, you know adult offspring so so if you're if you're married um you, you know certainly you could you and your wife could could each donate 100,000 rand to to your sons this year and then the balance uh, you know the 25,000 rand each in the next uh, uh, tax year so so that would be my, my suggestion uh, you, you know is the the simplest cleanest way to do it just keep records of everything and be sure to tell SARS what you've done, but but you're certainly entitled to do it, uh, and and doing it 
early in their lives while, while they're accumulating capital and and living with very natural debt that most people would have if it's you know a reasonable house um, and and helping them to pay it down I think is is an incredible gift and and I don't think enough parents think about this you know they, they kind of leave it you know to the will and and then you know their, their 60 year old children uh, get get some money when the 80 year old you know 85 year old parents die and I, I think you know that's also not bad but but I think the you know, most kids, uh, you know, adult kids at you know thirty-five or forty-five would would derive much more benefit from kind of early gifts of money uh, than later. And and certainly, you know, tax-wise, you know, donating to your children every year, if you could, would, would be a very efficient way of reducing your estate um, and and helping out your children at the same time. Does it have to be a physical transfer of cash? Can it be a book entry? Uh, I mean, I suppose you could do a loan. Um, I'm, 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 it's actually, a, a, I mean, again, fabulous question, but I'm not. I will. I'm okay, not sure I'm, going to, I'm going to leave it with you, Warren, because I'm just well, I looked up at the clock. I'm so engaged in our conversation, but perhaps you can revisit it next week, because I think that would be a useful question to answer. Warren Ingram, Galileo Capital financial advisor and uh, regular contributor to the Money Show.